Are you in Luke chapter 16? If you are, say amen. I want to ask you to stand with me, please. And let's look at verse 19. And we're going to read down through verse 23. Luke 16, verse 19. These are words in red. These are the words of Christ. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died. And he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. Many of you know that death does not care what is in your account. Death does not care what bracket you file your taxes. Death is coming for every person. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Dear Lord, I thank you today for this church. I thank you for everyone that has made the effort to be here. I thank you, Lord, that you have already visited us in worship, You've already sat with us in prayer. And now I pray that as we open up your word, that you would speak ever so clearly and plainly, that our lives might be challenged and shaped by the Scripture. Lord, I'll praise you for what you do. And it is in your Son's name I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to be preaching on a subject this morning that may be difficult for you to hear, but it is necessary. I'm going to give you something to laugh at, and you ought to take advantage of this right now. <laughs> I heard about a young lady who was dating this boy, and it had gotten pretty serious. He had asked her to marry him. She went home, and she sat down with her mother and said, You know, I really like him. She said, But he, he, he goes to a real liberal church. And said, I just don't know if it's going to work out. Her mother said, well, well, well what's, what, what's the hang-up? She said, well, he doesn't believe in hell. Her mother looked at that girl and said, just marry him, and between you and me, he will before too long. <laughs> now go ahead and laugh, because you're going to need that in just a few minutes. <laughs> hell is a real place. The world by mocking it, acknowledges the realness and the reality of hell. It is amazing that secular music has long chosen the subject of hell and to belittle it and to celebrate it while at the same time preaching to us that there is no such a place. It's amazing it finds its way into their lyrics if it's not a real place. You can go back in music and find it scattered all throughout top ten hits. But recently an artist released a song entitled All the Good Girls Go to Hell in an attempt to mock and belittle the reality of that place. Several years ago somebody sent me a song. I'm a, I'm a coon hunter. I, I like to hunt with hounds. And somebody sent me a bluegrass kind of country song and I was excited about it and it, the title of the song was Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven? And I thought, well, I've already got several there I, and I didn't ask. They just went on. <laughs> and I was excited about it. When I started listening to that song, it was, it was great. And then a line in the chorus said, if I can't take my hounds to heaven, I'd rather load up my dog box and go to hell with all my friends. And I turned it off with a grieved heart to again see that such an awful place can be belittled and placed in the spectrum of fantasy when in reality hell is more real than where we're sitting today. Hell is a real place. 
These words we have read today, these are words in red. These are the words of Christ. Did you know that Jesus' first sermon in Scripture chronologically was a sermon on hell? Hell is a real place. The story that we have read this morning, even some who claim to be theologians have belittled its significance in Scripture. And they have said this is a parable. You know, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And they've said this is just a parable. It's fictitious. It's not real people and it's not a real place. But I want to tell you unapologetically and plainly that Luke 16 verse 19 through 31 is not a parable. There are proper names used in this story. And in no other parable did Jesus use proper names. He references Abraham and he references Lazarus. And no other parable does Jesus use someone's proper name. This is a real place. And these were real people. The rich man was a real person. Lazarus was a real beggar. And they really died. And one really did open his eyes in heaven. And one really did open his eyes in hell. Hell is a real place. Now I know... It's not popular to preach on. But I didn't come to be popular. I came to honor God. Did you know that Jesus spoke of hell more than He spoke of heaven? In the New Testament alone, there are over 162 references to hell. And over 70 of them are used by Jesus Himself. Jesus preached on hell. There are entire denominations in our day that have rejected the reality of hell. And I'll not name them. I would, but I'm afraid somebody here today may be of that stripe. And I don't want you to turn me off because I named the place that you come from. But I'll just say this. There are entire organized denominations who have stepped outside of Scripture and just declared that they do not believe in hell. And you better listen to this little country preacher. It does not matter what you believe. It does not matter what you declare is truth. What matters is what the Word of God says plainly. We do not vote on Scripture at our, at our annual conference. We do not take a census and see how everybody feels about it. The Word of God speaks plainly and it stands on its own two feet. Entire denominations have said across the board, we don't believe in hell. Many of your modern translations have removed the word hell from the text of their scripture. If you have a Bible in your lap, that has removed the word hell, remove that Bible from your lap. Hell is a real place. And I don't care what faux scholar has decided it is offensive, hell is a real place. There are two beliefs about hell that are predominant in liberal theology. One is annihilism. And here's what they teach. They teach that hell is the grave. That when you die, you go into the ground and it's just... Story over. The screen goes black and in white letters it says the end. And they teach that the grave is all there is to death. It's called annihilism, but it's really called heresy that is nowhere in the Word of God. We are eternal spirits. You have to know that. You have to know that what is in us that makes us us is not just the beating of a heart and the inflow and outflow of oxygen. There is more to the human being than the function of physiology. We are eternal spirits that were created in the image of God and when this body ceases, this spirit continues. It does not go to the grave and cease to be. There is a second belief that, predomin that is predominant in liberal theology and it is called universalism. And here's what universalists believe. They believe that everybody's going to heaven. 
They'll tell you that there is a hell, but nobody's going there. That it's just for the devil and his angels. But I'm here to tell you that the Bible explains to us clearly that if we reject the offering of Christ's death, if we reject his blood atonement, that hell is reserved for those who have denied Jesus as their Savior. Everyone's not going to heaven. And we're not all God's children. We are by nature the children of wrath, the children of disobedience. But that's, we were born those kind of children. That's why we have to be born again as a child of God. We're not all going to heaven. We're born all going to hell. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a repentant heart that comes in faith and declares Him to be the Savior of all and the Savior of us that changes our eternal destination. Universalism may be a strong belief, but it will not stand the test of death and the test of eternity. Hell is a real place. We know that it is real because even in our text, even in our text, we see the reality of this man's experience in hell. You see, the Bible tells us in verse number 23 that this man could see in hell. His, the function of sight was still present in his spirit and he could see in hell. It is amazing to me that in the darkness of hell, in the darkness of that place, his physical sight in some level was still functioning. It is a terrifying thought to think about what they see in hell. It is a terrifying thought. We lost my father a week ago, a year, a year and a week ago. I should say a week ago we observed the one year of his passing. That make more sense. And all day, all day, on that day, I thought about the joy of seeing him again when I get to heaven. Boy, that hope is real. And that hope is lively. But to those that are not saved, can you imagine seeing your father or your son or your daughter in hell? just as real as those that are saved will see their loved ones in heaven. The only thing that hurts our heart more than our own pain is to see those we love in torment. I cannot fathom looking through the flames of hell and seeing someone that I love. This man could see and he could feel. Verse 23, he cried out, And the Bible says he was being in torments. That is physical torture. Matthew 25 verse 41 tells us that hell is a place of everlasting fire. Literal fire. We understand that in hell there is feeling. We understand that the nerves and the senses, they are aware in hell. And I do not understand all of how that transfers when the spirit leaves the body. But I do know this, that if if it is possible for a person to lose a limb and have those phantom pains and phantom itches, then God in His omnipotence is able to allow hell to inflict torment on the spiritual body of people. This man could feel... He could speak in hell. His his language, his voice still functioned in hell. He cries out with his mouth in hell and he speaks with his voice in hell. And And along the lines of what do they see in hell, this week my heart pondered, what do they say in hell? What do they say there? What words are used in hell? If they speak and they hear what is heard in those charred walls, 
that contained the damned souls of people that died without Christ. You know who's in hell? Adolf Hitler is in hell. Ted Bundy is in hell. Psychotic mass murderers are in hell. Rapists are in hell. Child molesters are in hell. The worst that's ever been are in hell. And there's also Baptist people in hell. There's also good citizens in hell. There are people that sat in pews just like this and they died without Christ and they're in hell. Can you imagine what you would hear inside of hell? I think one of the most remarkable truths on the reality of hell is that this man not only had all of his senses intact, but listen carefully, his desires were still thriving within him. What did he say? Tell Lazarus. You know, I I left him some crumbs. This guy's trying to phone in a favor from hell. Tell him I used to feed him scraps. Just, just, if if I could just get him, if I could just get somebody to put their finger in some water and just let a drop, just one drop of water fall on my tongue. He was thirsty. His physical, listen to me, his physical desires were still functioning. He was thirsty. That is a physical want. He was thirsty. You know what that tells me? It tells me that the senses are still intact and that the body is still going to desire what the body desires. And one of the most awful things about hell is that somebody better listen. I know some of y'all done turned me off and you thought, praise God, I ain't never coming back here again. I know. That's why I'm trying to load you up while you're here. So get it all in one shot. And I want you to listen closely. One of the awfulest things about hell is the things you wanted here you'll still want them down there. The alcoholic who would not give up his liquor to come to Jesus will be in the walls of hell still craving a drink and still shaking because he can't get one. There's no liquor stores in hell, friend. The dope addict who shot his veins out. I had a friend that was hooked on heroin. And he said to me, he said... He said, I was so addicted. He said, this is so vulgar to say, but I got to say it. He said, I would sit in a restaurant and I would look at people's veins. And he said, the way I used to lust after a good looking woman, I would lust after people's veins. He said, I I had shot dope everywhere I could put a needle. He said, I rotted out the inside of my foot, the arch of my foot from shooting up. And he said, all I wanted was a good vein to put a needle in. The dope addict in hell will still crave his drugs. But there is no dealer to cure that fix. The child molester in his perverted, despicable ways will still have unnatural desires for children, but they will not be satisfied. There is no pornography in hell. There are no victims available in hell. Hitler still hates Jews in hell. Hitler still hates those that he hated when he was alive. It is a reality that what you wanted here now, you will want there then. You do not cease to desire because you have died and gone to hell. And this rich man is evidence of that. I want you to notice that it's not only a place that's real, but it's a place where we have a functioning memory. Interesting contrast. Everybody doing all right this morning? I'm just obeying the Lord. Interesting contrast. The Bible tells us that when we stand before the Lord, I preached a funeral Monday and I quoted this verse out of Revelation, hallelujah, that God himself shall wipe away all tears. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no crying. There'll be no pain for the former things have passed away. And thank God in heaven, he makes all things new. You know how there's no weeping in heaven? I believe, I believe, 
I believe there's no weeping in heaven because God in His omniscience, in His omnipotence, His power, I believe that God will remove the sorrow from our system. And I don't know if He deletes those memories that would cause sorrow or if He just gives us enough of His understanding to see it through His eyes. But in heaven there is no remembrance that causes sorrow or pain. Woo! Some of y'all have been through some stuff. And it was 20 years ago and you still can't shake it. It was 40 years ago and you still feel it. But I'm glad to tell you one day heaven's going to fix everything that earth is broken. But the contrast is in hell, that memory is as vivid as it's ever been. You know what this man said? We didn't read this far into it. I didn't think y'all could take it. (laughs) That's probably right. You know what he said in this text? Let me find it. Verse 28. He said, I have five brethren. Would you send Lazarus to testify unto them, lest they come unto this place of torment? This man's in hell, remembering his brothers that have not died yet. What is he remembering? He remembers them being children. He remembers them playing in the yard. He remembers the times that they sat at the table as a family. He remembers the wonderful times they had and he realizes that those brothers are following in his footsteps and they too are going to die and he's going to see them in those same flames. The memory of hell is a terrible torment. Can you fathom Some of you here today, listen to me. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm trying to tell you the truth. Some of you are here today, and this is as close as you've been to the gospel. And here's what's terrifying to me. is If you leave here without Christ, and you die without Christ, and you go to hell, you will remember every word of this sermon. You'll remember this group up singing, His goodness is running after me. You'll remember the happy people sitting around you singing this little light of mine. You'll remember that cloudy overcast Sunday when you drove down a dirt road in a long driveway and a red-faced country preacher told you about a place that you didn't have to go to. The memory of hell is terrifying. To remember it. To live it over and over. I don't know who it was that said this, but it was a great, <laughs> it was a great mind and he was presented. A man said, I have developed a potion that will cause you to remember everything. He looked at him and he said, I'm not interested in that, but do you have one that will help me forget some things? In hell, the memory is alive. In hell, it is vivid and it is clear. I'll show you my last little thought on this. In hell, there is remorse, there is regret, but there is no room for repentance. See, remorse means that I, I feel bad for what I've done. How many of you know anything about remorse? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm preaching online next Sunday. That'll be fun. We'll just transition right into that. How many of you know anything about regret? I do. Sure do. Do you know the difference in remorse and regret here? We have a chance to do something about it. <laughs> I don't care what you have done. Listen to me. I don't care what you have done. Jesus Christ will save you forgive you, wash your soul in His blood, write your name in the Lamb's book of life, you will become His child and He'll become your Father and nothing can ever separate you from the love of God today. The millisecond after you die, 
You'll have remorse and you'll have regret, but you'll have no room for repentance. That's why we deal with Jesus when Jesus is dealing with us. This man, you know what amazes me, Brother Nelson? This man does not, he, he does not argue his case. He's not saying, I shouldn't be here. There's some mistake. Check the records. He's not arguing his case. He knows he deserves to be there. He is well aware he's ended up in the right place. And he has remorse and he has regret. But there is no repentance, which means he is able to change his direction. 